the question whether individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorder have a different sense of self than people without ASD, also known as neurotypicals, has fascinated researchers and clinicians for decades. If you look at scientific literature, and I'm going to link some papers in the description box below, we have to bear in mind that, you know, in most cases, the topic is covered from a neurotypical perspective. What does that mean? It means that the autistic experience usually is described as pathology, you know, using pathologizing language. So you recognize this when there is talk of, you know, deficits, difficulties, problems, fragility, disturbance, weakness or lack of ability. In this video, I would like to take a different perspective for once and look at the, you know, the self from a point of view of an autistic person. So instead of pathologizing, I would like to find out if we can find anything positive about the autistic way of being. Might what autistic people experience even be a skill, you know, a strength or an advantage? And how could neurotypical people benefit from the autistic experience? That is what I would like to explore today. So the question is how do autistic individuals actually experience self? I'm going to tackle this question using cognitive neuroscience criteria of self as my reference. So we will cross-check what is written about people with ASD with an actual autistic experience. I am just one person. And so what I report in no way suggests that you can extrapolate that to the autistic experience in general. It is just one anecdotal account, but it might inspire you to think about your own experience, you know, whether you have ASD or not. Consider that approximately one in 160 children born today has ASD. Uh, this is a WHO estimate. I feel it's time that we start covering topics like these from an inside out point of view. So we need to find a way how to deal with neurodiversity in a way that is life affirming rather than pathologizing it, you know. And that is the motiv motivation of this video. I'm taking this paper as my guideline for this video. A typical sense of self in autism spectrum disorders, a neurocognitive perspective by Victoria Lyons and Michael Fitzgerald. This paper is from March 2013 and is part of the book Recent Advances in Autism Spectrum Disorders, Volume 1. In cognitive neuroscience literature, operational definitions of the self are used, which are measurable by experiential methods, including self-recognition, self and other differentiation, body awareness, awareness of other minds, awareness of self as expressed in language, and important concepts such as autobiographical memory, and self-narrative. So let's go through these criteria one by one. The ability to recognize one's own face in the mirror is considered a test for self-awareness. Children with ASD have deficits of self-awareness as measured by a self-recognition test. They show little interest in their own mirror images and have been described as relatively face inexperienced. Since I'm not a toddler anymore, I can't say much to this criterion. Uh, I recognize myself when I look in the mirror, but for what it's worth, I tend not to look into mirrors, you know, every time I would get the chance, because I find looking at myself rather uninteresting. So unless I, I have a particular purpose, uh, I'd rather look at something else. <laughs> The ability to differentiate between self and other is also essential for the development of self-awareness, which appears to be impaired in autism. I'm going to take the statement at face value. From my personal autistic perspective, this is true and false at the same time. It is false in the sense that conceptually I can absolutely differentiate between self and other. It is true in that, to me, I experience more of an overlap between myself and others on a 
energetic level, for lack of a better word. So I've always tried to explain this away by saying that I just seem to be more sensitive than the average person. Um, what happens um, is I tend to feel too much when I'm around other people and I pick up on people's energy and it has a tendency to sort of intrude my own energy, so at least that's what it feels like. Anecdotal reports indicate that some children and adults with autism have an insecure body image or totally lack body awareness. This resonates with me. I have never felt um, in my body much. Uh, I feel more in my head. Uh, trying to describe this feeling, I would say I feel like a brain in a jar. Uh, also, I've always found my body to be more in the way than you know, being useful, really. Uh, in my dreams, for instance, uh, I oftentimes float, hover or fly and it's frustrating to wake up to gravity in the morning. <laughs> so in times of crisis, such as in situations of overloads, shutdowns or meltdowns, I have experienced complete dissociation from my body in the past. That does not seem to impede on my sense of agency though. When I'm well, I can get done whatever I put my mind to, no problem. An essential component of self-awareness is the ability to be aware of other minds. A multitude of studies have provided evidence that theory of mind is lacking or delayed in ASD. That, in my view, is completely misconceived. It is not at all that I am not able to put myself in someone else's shoes or empathize. On the contrary, it is like I described uh, in Criterion 2, uh, there, there seems to be you know, a lack of boundaries, which is what feels uncomfortable. So if you think of people as clouds of energy and their emotions, moods and thoughts to be part of that cloud, when people get close, those clouds start to intersect. And it seems as if um, I, as an autistic person, have a way of taking this information indirectly without filter, which is why I had to actually learn how to distinguish between my emotions, moods and thoughts and those of other people. In apparent contrast to the mentalizing impairment, even among very high functioning individuals with ASD, is their often documented increased sense of self or total focus on the self that is also reflected in numerous biographical accounts. Extreme egocentricity was one of the diagnostic criteria for Asperger's syndrome. That also seems to me completely wrong. On the contrary, from a very early age, I had my parents, for example, tell me that I am much too concerned with everybody else's well-being, that I am way too allocentric and that I should start to develop a stronger sense of self. This too seems to hint at autistic people's struggle with sensory overload. Too much sensory input leads to an immediate cascade of overload, shutdown and meltdown. Those states of being are incapacitating. Once you're in a shutdown or meltdown, you sometimes need days to recover. So it seems rational that such a person would need to learn very precisely how to manage their own nervous system in order not to experience overloads, etc. So maybe it's that need to carefully regulate our energy, which leads other people to think that we are egotistic. Awareness that we are the same person across time, also defined as temporally extended self-awareness, is an essential part of one's self-concept. Temporally extended self-awareness is impaired in ASD based on their problems with theory of mind as well as some aspects of temporal cognition. Here's what I think is happening. And it's probably best if I use a metaphor. Imagine if you had the choice between being a fixed particle or a wave function. I would choose to be a wave function. I prefer potential over actualization. 
Being a particle is one dimensional and boring. Linear time is boring. I'd rather live in potentiality and in, so in the now, you know, I experience myself to be a multi-dimensional being. So while the notion of I is somewhat useful to navigate four dimensional space time, there seems to be much more to life than this. And I like to experience what I can only describe as flow or flow state. It's a state of being that is not constricted by a physical body or a narrow concept of self. There is substantial clinical and research evidence of impaired pragmatic language use in children with ASD, as indicated by pronoun reversal errors, I, me, you, reflecting general difficulties with their sense of self as well as problems in self-other differentiation. It's true, if there was a way around saying I, I would be all for leaving it out. To me, I is a limiting concept. Yes, there are instances when we need to refer to ourselves as I, but in my opinion, our world has become way too self-important and built around the concept of I-ness to the detriment of all. The majority of components that make up an autobiographic memory system are impaired in autism. There is significant evidence that individuals with ASD have circumscribed episodic memory impairments. They have an impaired recall for personally experienced events. The past is boring. So yes, I tend to forget autobiographic stuff because, you know, it's in the past and I'd rather not dwell on it, but explore the present. Autobiographical memory must correlate with your level of identification with the I concept. I believe the I concept is largely constituted by autobiographical memory. So why cling to autobiographical memory when you are not interested in the I concept? I think what is happening is that autistic people are so busy with processing sensory data that they need to free up any bit of you know RAM <laughs> that they can you know, just to navigate what is in the now. If autobiographical material cannot be provided, the narrative is disoriented and confused and in many cases is no narrative at all, but only confabulation, which is often the case in autism. I think this might be an explanation why socializing in a neurotypical dominated society is so strenuous to people with ASD. Questions like, so what do you do? Or tell me about yourself, are exhausting because they refer to something which is completely boring. It bores me to tears. <laughs> I'd much rather discuss some science-related topic or learn something new. Why would I want to repeat the same story over and over again? That's not fun at all. So while I absolutely could recount a self-narrative, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to do that. I simply don't think it's a priority. A sense of self emerges from the activity of the brain in interaction with other selves. There is substantial evidence that early deficits in self-development, including impaired relations with others, result in a fragmented and atypical sense of self in ASD. Consequences of this atypical sense of self are the well-documented impairments individuals with ASD experience in the social, and communication domain. In contrast, there have been suggestions that this different sense of self might be a contributory factor to the significant talents and special skills presented in the majority of individuals with ASD. So let's put this in perspective. We have a situation in which the makeup of your brain seems to determine the degree to which you can develop a sense of self or highness. Science looks to measure such phenomena. So a set of criteria is used to standardize the experience of self and make different experiences comparable with each other. It serves as a means of orientation. Let's take the normal distribution of IQ scores in the general population as example. 
This is how intelligence is distributed. You can measure your IQ and place yourself on that chart. Let's assume we have a similar situation when it comes to the sense of self. The way I see it, if we measure degree of identification of ego consciousness, people with ASD would feature in the lower percentiles, whereas neurotypical people occupy the rest of the chart, going all the way to extreme self-importance on the far right. If on the other hand, we had a way to measure degree of identification with universal consciousness, the situation might look completely different. It is possible that ASD is correlated with your ability to identify with universal consciousness. The discussion of which type of consciousness is more desirable or sustainable is a normative one. So I'm not going to go into that in this video today. All I'm trying to suggest is that, you know, there might be different modes of consciousness and that on an evolutionary scale, it might very well be that human beings are supposed to evolve from ego consciousness to universal consciousness. And if that were so, it would be important to develop criteria that are able to measure the occurrence of universal consciousness in individuals. And in the second step, you know, it would be nice to find out how people with ASD are doing in that category compared to neurotypicals. At this moment in time, our world is organized to cater to and foster ego consciousness, to strengthen the sense of self. There is consensus about what is considered normal or neurotypical and what is not. ASD, by definition, falls into the abnormal category. And that categorization is built on your typical determinations and value statements. So all I hope is that I was able to broaden your horizon a little bit, whether or not you have ASD. Um, I'm personally curious to learn how you experience self, so if you'd like to share, please drop your take in the comments. That was it for today, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.